to Backyard Farmer coming to you from the 242 house in Cozad, Nebraska. We can't take your phone calls tonight because obviously we are not inside. There are no telephones, but you can still send us those pictures and emails to byf at unl.edu. As always, please give us as much information as you can. Please do tell us where you are. That will really help us answer your question. And do be sure you follow us on Facebook. You can watch us on YouTube. Lots and lots of ways to get that great information from Backyard Farmer. So as always, we're going to start with samples. I do want to say this is the first time we've been on the road in two years and the first time we've had four panelists. So this is going to be a lot of fun. Kyle, you're up with an insect of some sort. An insect of some sort, yes. Uh, this is a green June beetle. And uh, these, these adults have, have just started emerging within the last week or so, at least in Lincoln. Um, so we've been getting a fair, a fair number of questions about these. Uh, green June beetles, um, so these are, you know, metallic-ish green, as you can see here. Uh, there is a, a, a bit of variation. Some have more brownish, um, but that, that sort of brown on them will vary from individual to individual uh, and about an inch long. So these beetles, uh, they will, will pupate generally in May, uh, and then the adults emerge in July. And uh, this is uh, one that they're, they're a little bit, in terms of their biology, a little bit like Japanese beetles, uh, but they're native and, and far less destructive. So the, the grubs do, um, you, you find them in a variety of, of organic substrates, of organic so, uh, soils, excuse me, uh, where they're generally feeding on decaying organic material, um, but they will also go in turf and, and can feed on, on roots of, of grasses and you know, can cause a little bit of, of trouble that way. Usually not a big problem. Um, but one thing interesting that the, uh, the grubs will do is they'll actually tunnel. They'll come up to surface at night, and usually that tunneling is, is more sort of the destructive part in, uh, in turf rather than actual feeding on, on the roots. Uh, so in addition to that, the adults will also feed on leaves. Um, they really like fruit. Um, it can be damaging to, to a variety of different fruits and berries. So to control these guys, um, you know, usually uh, if you're not seeing that tunneling damage, you don't have to do anything in the lawn. But uh, if you are seeing that, because they, they do surface at night, actually uh, a carbaryl treatment on the surface of the lawn and not watered in is actually really effective for this. So they'll be exposed to that when they, when they surface. Um, and then for the adults, really what I, I recommend, the best thing to do is just really make sure that you're on top of harvesting um, those fruits, making sure you're, you're picking them off as they're ripening so that you're not sort of allowing those adults to come in. Um, and then, um, you know, don't, don't leave any overripe fruit around. All right. Thank you, Kyle. Dennis. Okay. Since we're at a restaurant, I decided not to bring the snakes, even though I caught some here in Dawson County. But I did bring, uh, and you can see the URL, this is electronic field guide for your phone that identifies all the frogs, turtles, and reptiles of the state of Nebraska. And I usually get a lot of hits on it per day. And if you can't identify it for everything on here, this even has the frog calls, so you don't have to buy my CD anymore. Um, so you can get all the frog calls on here without buying my CD. Um, but you can identify anything. And if you can't identify it from my description, you take a picture of it, load it on this website, hit Ask the Expert, and it ends up on my phone. And I tell you what it is. Just include what county you're in, and we'll tell you all about it. And if it's really cool, we'll save it for Backyard Farmer. All right, Amy, what do you have today? <coughs> so I know we're not all the way in the panhandle, but we're closer, right? So I had to bring beets. Uh, and so these are out of my garden. And what I have going on here is Cercospora leaf blight on beets. Um, the unique thing is this is the exact same disease we get on sugar beets. So when we're looking at a home garden, Typically, this disease doesn't cause a lot of issues. It gets these dark outer rings and that tan center um, to that spot. Um, so I typically don't recommend a fungicide application. However, if you do look at doing a fungicide application and you are located closer to that panhandle, we do have some instances where we're starting to see some uh, fungicide resistance to this pathogen. So if you're spraying it in the panhandle because of the sugar beets, you'll definitely want to take a note of that. Um, definitely get a hold of us at the panhandle station. Bob Harvison is there. 
or your local extension educator because we want to look for that resistance to this pathogen that we are seeing throughout the state on sugar beet production. Thank you, Amy. All right, John, you can't exactly put your sample in your lap, I don't believe. No, now for something completely different, right? <laughs> um, so I like to talk about hydroponics in my work. A lot of people are getting interested in it. And I built these very simple systems that I'm showing off at our office. Uh, and this is uh, the simplest hydroponic system that you can build. You can put it on your deck, your patio. You can even bring it inside during winter uh, to grow things. This is just basically a large storage tote uh, that you can buy at any hardware store, any, any type of store. Uh, and I have peppers growing in here. And really all it is is I bought these net pots. You buy them you know, sometimes to plant, uh, you know, pond plants in, you can buy them at pond stores, places like that. And then this is a, a hydroponic uh, material that I bought. It's like a puffed clay that soaks up the water. But you can use like perlite or you can use something very simple just to hold the plant in because all of the nutrients are coming from the water. You'll add fertilizer to that. It can be simple as something as simple as like a complete fertilizer that you buy, like the water soluble, the ones that cause miraculous growth, right? We're not going to, you know, use a brand name. Um, or you can get the specific hydroponic fertilizer because you have to provide everything, even the micronutrients that usually come from the soil. And we don't, you know, we usually fertilize with the three numbers, N, P, and K. This, we have to provide all 16 of the essential nutrients for plants in that water. And you can do that with fertilizer, but it's very simple and very fun. It can be a great experiment for you in your garden. Excellent. Thank you, John. All right. Let us start with picture questions. Kyle, you have three, and they're all ID. The first one comes to us from Cozad. It is, found this crawling on her after she'd been harvesting beets. What is it? This is an eyed click beetle. Um, so they, they get the, the name eyed from those two little eye spots behind the head. Um, and then they, the click beetles, they all um, have this sort of mechanism that they, they make the click sound and flip up in the air to, to right themselves. So this is, you know, something that's generally good. Um, the, the larvae for these, they feed on uh, wood boring grubs of other beetles. All right. Your next one comes from Ord. And this one uh, is also a, what was this? It was on the front door and it kind of hung out for a while. Yep, this is a plume moth. Uh, they're really, really common. Um, characteristic moths, they, they have this uh, characteristic shape. They hold those wings out to the side, so they make that T shape. Um, and they're, they're highly attracted to light, so not unusual. We would see them sort of coming to a porch light or something like that and hanging out. All right, and finally, you have one from Mitchell. So we're all over the state this time. Uh, this wasp made it into her house, flew frantically in the window to get back outside. They didn't swat it because they weren't sure whether it was a good one or a bad one. So, and, and there was mud involved. Yeah, yep, definitely mud involved. This is a yellow-legged mud dauber wasp. Um, as far as whether it's good or bad, I, I would say it's kind of neutral. Um, definitely not bad. Um, they're solitary, so it's you know really not something you have to worry about stinging you. Very unlikely. Um, but these, the the females, they actually paralyze, uh, sting and paralyze spiders, and then provision the nest with spiders, and that's what the larvae feed on. So, you know, because they're you know they're taking out other predators, maybe not the most beneficial, but definitely not a bad thing. If they're killing spiders, I like them a lot. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Dennis. Uh, this is a North Lincoln viewer. Okay. She says something is eating slash killing her grass. She's been trying to reseed for the last two years. Looks great, and then it starts disappearing. Little spots of missing turf all over just under the canopy of the tree. She okay. wonders, is this, what is this? It's hard to tell. And in the shaded areas, if it's nice new grass, anything from a rabbit to even a squirrel may chew it down to the crown to get some nutrients, and even voles would do that. But it doesn't seem to be the pattern of a vole or a ground squirrel, but rabbits are very kind of missed about that. It doesn't look like a peck mark from a bird. So the best I can see from this one picture, I would have to say probably a small, young rabbit who's feeding at night. All right, and your second one is actually, uh, this was taken in West Des Moines, Iowa. Um, large two-inch wasp-type insect flying around. They think it was a cicada killer, but they don't know if the cicada killer and this hole are related. Yes, this is a hole not built by a vertebrate pest, but built by a cicada killer. And we can have Kyle talk a little more, but cicada killers are our largest wasp. 
and the female paralyzes a cicada and puts it down the hole and lays a complement of eggs and that feeds the cicada. I'm sure you could get stung by the female, never by the male, but I've grabbed them before and it's nothing, so. <laughs> well, and, and I think the real question on this one is why is this not a critter hole? What about it makes it not oh, a critter sure. hole? Oh, sure, it's granular and I, don't say, I see kind of a groove and this is a type apparatus that you see with the cicada killer wasp and not from a worm or a vertebrate. All right, it's, excellent. They actually pick it up with their jaws so the grains are really small. Excellent, all right, and your next two pictures are from North Platte. Uh, one day apart, it's a whiskey barrel, planters, something dug a hole in the potting soil, wondered if it was squirrels. It's the first time something has happened. The next day, another hole, and it went way deep. Okay, if it's going way deep and not just shallow, if it's shallow, it could be a squirrel burying nuts, and they do it even this time of year. But if it goes deep, it's probably a vole, V like in Victor and they eat tubers in the roots of a lot of plants. And so I think that vole is jumping in there, probably got some surface roots and went, yummy, I'm coming back here tomorrow, my friends for dinner. And it dug deeper and got, the, got into those roots. All right, thank you, Dennis. All right, uh, Amy, your first two pictures here are a crab apple in Lincoln. Mm -hmm. uh, she said it came out perfectly in the spring, flowered, and then the little crab apple set. She can't see any other damage. What's wrong? Should she worry about it? So with how fast the spray ants turn brown and wilting, I would actually lean toward fire blight, which is a bacterial disease that's moved by our wonderful pollinators that we need. Um, so the best treatment for this is actually going to prune it out. But you're going to prune it out from where you see symptoms. And because it's bacterial, we want to go 12 to 14 inches beyond that. And then once you make that prune cut, you want to dip your pruners in either Clorox wipes or disinfectant wipes or put it in 10% alcohol um, just to kill the bacteria before you make another cut. Otherwise, you will move the bacteria within your crab apple tree too. All right, thank you, Amy. Your next one is a carny viewer. Um, this one says, do her fruit trees have cedar apple rust? They had some cedar trees in the past year that did have rust this spring, and then they're wondering if it can be treated, and if so, when? So this is the classic cedar apple rust. You got that yellow border with that dark center in it. This is not the time of year that we're going to treat for cedar apple rust. You're actually going to wait to make those applications in the spring when the leaves are starting to unfurl. And if you are trying to produce apples on it, then you're going to continue a normal um, fruit spray uh, Regu regiment for fungicides and insecticides to keep all those pests away. All right, and your final one is actually a picture of just beautiness. So this, this is, a, this is a, on a branch that came down during a storm and they thought we would enjoy it, and, but they do want to know what it is. This one was really fun to actually take a look at and I actually identify it. It's a jelly fungus, but it's actually called yellow brain jelly fungus because it looks like the inside of a brain, I guess. Um, this fungus is an indication that you have a heart rot or a dry rot occurring in your tree. And so this fungus only eats on dead organic matter. So with that being the case, I would really recommend that you take a look at your tree, see where that branch fell off, because if it's on that main portion of your tree, you might be looking at some structural integrity issues of that tree. And if it's close to uh, structural or um, vehicles, we may want to take a look at that before we get another storm to come through. But very pretty, pretty, pretty fungus. All right, thanks, Amy. I mean, there are worse names like dog vomit slime mold, <laughs> That's right? That's true. <laughs> brain fungus, and it does right. look like a yellow brain. Right. Yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, you have two uh, pictures for this first one. This is from Imperial, John. What is wrong with these grapevines? Um, two rows planted along an east-west oriented fence, 50 feet apart on both ends of a yard. Yard is sprayed by a commercial lawn service. Uh, vines are old. What do we have going on here? So we see some different uh, symptoms on here. So we see that really strapping on that first picture. Those, some of those leaves look weir really weird with really weird margins. And then we see this sort of bubbling warty look on this one. This is a classic 
uh, herbicide drift damage. Uh, could either be from that lawn service or, you know, in Nebraska whenever uh, the weather gets hot and we've used herbicides in the area on agricultural fields, uh, it can spread two to three miles. Uh, and so it could be from either of those, but that is classic herbicide damage on those grapes. That's one of the most susceptible crops. Like a lot of wineries are having problems with that. Uh, and in our vegetable garden, it's tomato. This is the other, this is the fruit side. So this is, this is grapes. Really, it's, your grapes are going to be okay. Um, I may not eat the grapes from that this year, but it should be okay in the future. We just don't know the safety of those products used on a food crop. All right, John, and your final one is from Ravenna, and this viewer found yellow choke cherries in the regular row. Is that weird, or, and can they eat them? Well, yes, they did find yellow choke cherries, and there are yellow choke cherries. Uh, you can eat them. Uh, I actually got a choke cherry question the other day about I've heard that choke cherries are poisonous. Well, every other part of the plant is poisonous, but the flesh of the berry. So don't, you know, don't chew on the leaves. You know, don't eat the twigs. Don't chew on the the, the seed inside, because they actually have a chemical in them that when you ingest it, it turns into cyanide. That sounds like fun, right? Don't. So yes, you can eat the berries, but don't eat any other part of the plant. All right. Thank you, John. Well, you know, in this last year, we have had just a monster number of gardeners coming new to the gardening world. And so many of them, what they really want is something fresh and something safe. That is, of course, the core mission of 242 House here in COZAD. They want to provide a really wonderful dining experience that is fun, fine dining, accessible, and right at home using local products. So let's take a minute to hear about 242 House. My name is Susan Kuhlman, and I'm the owner of the 242 House in Cozad, Nebraska. We are a farm-to-table bar and restaurant. Our mission here is to serve world-class food, and we like to make as much as we can from scratch using lo local ingredients as much as we can. Our food is meant to be, in to be eaten by everybody, and we work really hard to ensure that it's approachable. I have some really great local partners here, and um, one of them, his name is Kent Ross. He's a retired art teacher. This week I'm getting cucumbers and zucchini and lettuces, um, onions. I'm getting a lot of things from him. Um, I try to go out and harvest fresh um, at least twice a week. Depends about the heat, what that is, you know. But I like the flexibility that we have because a lot of restaurants have a steady menu and their patrons come in and maybe they're disappointed if something's not offered. Part of our conversation with our customers have been, fresh means the menu's gonna change based on availability. We rarely serve anything frozen. Nothing will ever be frozen unless it's something that needs to be frozen. It's about the effort that goes into it. So when people know that something's made fresh for them, they know that somebody went out into the garden early, that somebody's made sure that it's lived, that somebody's um, not put chemicals on it to keep the bugs away. I think really America is really getting on to that um, movement of, you know, the extra effort is worth it. And um, hey, I'll go through fast food just as soon as the next guy was, will if I'm hungry. It's not always available, right? But when you have the opportunity to experience something that's made from scratch that day, as fresh as it can, I, I guarantee you're gonna start changing the way you look at food. So with my chef, we're really trying to think ahead what might be available next week. And we work really closely, my husband and I work closely with the overall feel of the menu, um, but we really rely on him to um, focus on what can he do with the fresh ingredients. Our menu rotates. I like to try to keep most of them consistent for at least a month, but the vegetables will always change because we've got to figure out what's the next vegetable that we can um, pair with everything. As you look around here on the patio of the 242, we've built some raised beds. I've got, um, I'm always trying new things. But what I've discovered is that people love to touch and feel. And so a lot of what you see is, I could just call it a sensory garden. It is so wonderful to see people just walking and touching and smelling and turning to their friend or partner and saying, what is this, you know, and trying to figure it out. So I think that lends to part of that food experience. It's not just about the eating that we were talking about. It's really about planting a seed for wanting to learn more. I want 242 to be an experience. So I want it to be a visual experience, an emotional experience, and a dining experience. Nobody needs to open a restaurant just to open a restaurant. There's restaurants all over the world. Somebody needs to open a restaurant that makes a difference in how people understand food, how they 
consume food, how they grow food, and um, maybe we've just made a little bit of difference right here. So that's what we do. <laughs> What is not to love? To be able to come and have something local, fresh, and really, really enjoy this beautiful place and new ingredients that you might even be able to grow in your own garden in John's hydroponic thing, whatever that is. All right. <laughs> so, insect, next. Let's see, you have frass on a petunia, Kyle. Um, they don't see any insects. What is this from? It sounds like it's, it's probably tobacco budworm. Um, the petunias are, are one of their preferred hosts, um, and they, they like to hide out during the day. So um, I suspect if you go out and investigate in the evening with a flashlight, you'll probably find the caterpillars there. Um, and so for, for treatment for those, um, unfortunately, their you know, BT really doesn't work well for them. They're, they're pretty resistant. Um, you can try hand picking if it's a pretty small planting of petunias. Um, otherwise, maybe permethrin would, would be an option. All right, your next two pictures uh, come to us from Scott's Bluff. And this was actually a, a worm that she accidentally cut in half with her pruning shears, but she's got her hand in there so you can see how big it was. <laughs> what is that? Yeah, this, this is a, um, actually I think it's two different hornworms. Uh, so they were probably both decapitated because it's the, the backside of, of two. And these are Achaemon Sphinx uh, moss or the caterpillars for that. So they're, they're real large, showy uh, moth. The, the, uh, the larvae will feed on um, grapes. Um, so not really a, a, a big pest or anything, but. All right, and your next, your final one is also a, a, a worm and said, uh, are these going to damage my garden? This one, yes, these can be a big problem. Uh, this is, <clears throat> excuse me, these are uh, tobacco hornworms. Um, and they, they like a variety of solanaceous crops, so potatoes, peppers, tomatoes, um, and they can be pretty serious to foliators. So um, when they're real small, you can treat them with, with a variety of different um, treatments, chemicals, uh, BT, um, but as, as those caterpillars get larger, they're really less susceptible. Uh, the good thing is if it's a small garden, again, hand picking is a really viable, very effective option for these. They're pretty easy to find because they do get large. Um, so hand pick, uh, dispose of in soap water. Um, otherwise, a large one, maybe carbaryl, would, would probably be your best bet if you had to treat with something. All right. Thank you, Kyle. All right. Dennis, it is watermelon season, and apparently we have a viewer here from Omaha who uh, has some critters that also think so. She has two pictures here. Uh, she, th she set a dozen traps baited with peanut butter, cheese, and carrots, and they caught these vermin. And then she, uh, she's done that again and caught more of these vermin. So what is it that is eating her watermelons? Well, what's eating the watermelon is likely a vole or a deer mouse. And what she caught is a shrews or shrews that eat the vermin. So you just got rid of your helpers. Oh, um, no. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, you don't bait with peanut butter after something that's eating your watermelon, you bait with watermelon um, because you're not gonna get the same thing. Uh, these guys like protein and the shrews like to eat insects and they kill. They have a very high metabolism. They have to eat almost uh, their body weight a day. And believe it or not, even though they're half the size of a vole, they go out for the neck of the vole um, and kill the vole and eat the vole. So, your best thing to do is either to trap for the bowl with a box trap where they go in and don't come out and enhance your, I know you can't bring the shrews back to life, but hopefully there's some other shrews there that can help you. <laughs> All right. And your, your final one here is, uh, this is a yellow marigold mystery, Dennis. It is uh, yellow marigold heads only and they find them just the heads bitten off when they are just flowering, they don't touch anything else. What do you think that could be? It's usually when it's a flower feeder, it's usually a 13 line ground squirrel or a Franklin ground squirrel. They like to eat dandelion fl um, flowers or fluorescence, and they will go after almost any plant, grab the flower, eat part of it, and leave the rest down there and go after another flower. Um, so it's likely, without seeing any other evidence, a 13 line ground squirrel. All right. 
All right, Amy, uh, this is an ongoing problem in Kearney uh, at Arrowhead Village Senior Living Complex. Pin Oak starts out every year looking good, gradually dies, branch isn't dead. He did do some good treatments on this with iron. No cankers, 130 feet away is just fine. So, you know, iron chlorosis usually doesn't cause a crown to die out. So I would be leaning towards some type of canker up there. But the other trick is if the other tree near it looks just fine, I'd probably start looking at root girdling um, potential. So see if you can see those roots starting to go around. And over time, those root girdles just basically just, just starves the plant and chokes it to death. Um, so that's what I would be kind of leaning towards, probably a root issue. Um, in pin oak, I wouldn't recommend coming back in with a pin oak for Carney just because it's very susceptible to iron chlorosis, no matter what you do. All right, and your final picture comes to us from Hastings. Uh, after the storm hit much of central and eastern Nebraska, these spots started sh showing up. So this is more recent than that last one. Okay. So once again, you see the iron chlorosis, the dark veins with the yellow, but with the spots that you're seeing in there, it's a fungal disease called tubacink. Tubacanca is what I call it. I probably don't pronounce it correctly. Very common fungal disease that we see in oak after a major weather event. So lots of water, which you would have seen about that time. Typically, it isn't anything that we treat. We see it throughout the Midwest. Um, it may cause some premature defoliation if we get some more wet weather, but overall, it should not harm the tree. All right, thank you, Amy. All right, your first two pictures, John, come to us from Hopper. And uh, they misplaced the seed packet on this critter. Uh, they thought it was, uh, they, they don't know what it is. They uh, <laughs> thought it was zucchini, but it's 18, 19 inches around. So <laughs> what is it? <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm not exactly sure. I couldn't, I couldn't exactly find what this is. It definitely, it's definitely a squash. <laughs> All right. Um, I would say looking at the inside of it that we see that um, I would say it would be something like a, I don't think it's related to the zucchini it's more like a Hubbard type of squash I yeah. think um, so I don't know the exact cultivar but it, I'm leaning toward that direction all right next year they're going to keep the tags <laughs> yeah keep the keep the packet or remember what <laughs> yeah. you bought right all right your next one comes to us from North Platte uh, this clearly is not a burpees big boy. What do we think this is? So we see those elongated type tomatoes. That's sort of a, a type of uh, uh, Roma tomato, some sort of paste type tomato. So either the tag got switched, uh, which is probably the most likely thing that happened, or whichever breeder was, you know, developing those seeds for the, the company, they had like a little extra pollen slip in somewhere. So like the milkman stopped by the tomato patch. Uh, and um, so, yeah, it's a Roma type tomato. <laughs> <laughs> and your final one, uh, this is a cherry and grape tomatoes growing in a pot in Midtown Omaha. They've harvested fruit, but then they saw these warts on the plant and they kind of freaked out. What is that? Right, it sort of looks like a weird, you know, like swamp creature coming out of that tomato. And it's actually perfectly normal. That's adventitious roots. So tomatoes have this thing where anywhere their stems are wet or touch soil, they will actually grow roots. So you might have seen like if you have a squash plant and the vine goes along the ground, it will put out roots at the nodes. Tomatoes do that all along the plant. So if you've ever planted tomatoes and someone's told you plant it deep, that's because all along that stem, roots will grow out, and that is just the adventitious roots. All right, excellent. Well, you know, our garden is always a wonderful surprise. We're never quite sure how things are going to perform. But as always, here is Terry James to show us some beautiful things in our backyard farmer garden. This week in the Backyard Farmer Garden, we're going to start looking at what worked really well and what kind of didn't really do so well this year. A lot of the seeds that we started in the greenhouse, some of the flowers are looking fantastic. We have a Nicotiana that looks really good, really is starting to pop. It's got some white flowers, so it'll be very attractive to those evening pollinators. We have a Shade Coleus that's looking really good. It's a mix. So it has lots of different colors in it and it looks really nice underneath the shade of our big oak tree in our garden. 
We have some different reds and we have an amaranth that is looking really nice. So we may need to try that one out again next year or maybe try a different color, not for sure. But we're gonna write down those notes in our journal and make sure that we keep track of what's looking good. So stop by the Backyard Farmer Garden and check them out. So instead, we are going straight to the plants of the week. All right, John, what do we have today? Well, and I don't know what to do because I'm usually like have a vase on the desk. I have like a little bouquet here that I'm holding. <laughs> which matches uh, your shirt. Which matches my shirt. We planned it exactly like that. So here we have ironweed, which is a great native. It's also a great pollinator plant. They love the, that purple flower there. Uh, so uh, it grows in sort of uh, rocky type areas. Uh, it's okay with sort of not great soil uh, as well. And so that's a good pollinator plant, adds some color to the garden. Of course, where I'm from, uh, back on the East Coast, it's like wild everywhere and everyone wants to kill it out of their garden. Uh, and then we have uh, this little, uh, uh, this is wild rye. Uh, so an interesting grain there that we uh, just add there. You know, sort of like, you know, you can see behind me, there's rye behind me at the bar too, I think. <laughs> Maybe I can trade later, uh, you know, for a, you know, a drink, I don't know. Uh, so yeah, those are our plants of the week. and. I don't know what to do with these, so uh, we'll just, so uh, I don't them. know. I'll just, uh, anyone back there getting married soon, right? So <laughs> All right. there we go. <laughs> Thank you, John. All right, um, Kyle, this one comes to us from Imperial. This, uh, these insects were first on the raspberry bushes, then they moved to their asparagus. What are they? Are they helpful in the garden uh, or harmful? These are helpful. Um, well, not these in particular. These are arthinid wasps, um, and this is a, a group of males. The males like to um, like to congregate on vegetation, either you know to get out of sort of the heat during the day or sleeping at night. Um, but the females, they they burrow into into soil and then lay eggs on on grubs uh, in turf, and so then those those uh, larvae are parasitoids of of grubs and and uh, help control them. Excellent. All right. Uh, your next one is from Ravenna. This insect has been eating her taters. What is it? She's tried seven. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Um, it's a blister beetle. They, uh, these do kind of sometimes swarm um, and, and can be fairly transient, kind of coming and going. And so it could be um, with, with the seven treatment before that maybe just sort of new ones came in after that because uh, normally carbaryl is effective for, for these. Um, another thing you could also treat with is, uh, is permethrin. You could, you could give that a shot if the carbaryl isn't working. Um, and also just, you know, if, if they haven't been around too long, you might just sort of wait and see if they go away on their own. A lot of times they will pretty quickly. All right. Thank you, Kyle. And your final one is, uh, comes to us from Scott's Bluff on a young burr oak that has branches low to the ground. What is this? Yeah, this is an interesting one. Uh, at first, I thought maybe this was a, a ladybug um, pupa because the, you know, it looked like there was maybe some aphids on this oak. Um, but it's actually, I believe, uh, an Argus tortoise beetle. And uh, these feed on, on plants in the bindweed family. Um, and because those, you know, it sort of had those low-hanging branches, I suspect it just climbed up there to pupate. All right, excellent. All right, Dennis, uh, you have three pictures for this first one, I do believe. This is Albion. It's a willow. Uh, they're wondering about the appearance of the willow. Is this normal for the trunk on this? And it also appears that maybe something is rubbing on the base. Right. What do we think? And, and uh, is this a goner? Yeah, no, it's not a goner. Um, what this looks like from these pictures is squirrel territorial marking. So every day or so, the male squirrel will go to, uh, it could be a picnic table or your garage door or the base of a tree where they have a nest, and they'll chip a little, and they'll go quite a f ways up, you know, easily a couple meters or six foot up. They'll chip and rub their chin, and that's telling all the other squirrels, my turf, back off. So it's squirrel graffiti. And uh, they usually don't do enough digging into the bark to get into the camdium to cause problems. All right, and your next picture is a Lincoln viewer that has an oak that also has the bark stripped, apparently a little bit on one side and three feet up on the other, and they're wondering the same yeah. thing here. This also looks like tree squirrel, but here it's not just territorial marking. They actually took the bark off and they're exposing that Camden, and they're getting that starch and sugars out of that. And they usually do it to elms and maples, 
Uh, I'm not sure of the species of tree here. Um, they don't do as much to native trees because squirrels adapt it with native trees, but they do it to those that have a lot of sugar content. All right, and your final one is, uh, this is a pin oak uh, that is dropping lots of green leafy clusters. What, uh, what did this? <laughs> okay, so this could be squirrels or it could be um, a girdler. Mm -hmm. And the way to do that is to get this branch that's on the bottom uh, that's fallen and look at the, the end that got cut. If it's a 45 degree angle, that's the teeth of a squirrel. And it's usually young males, they're thinking about building a nest, they're young males, so they don't know what they're doing, like any young male, and they drop it. And then they go, wait a minute, I'm supposed to build a nest, and they get another one, and then they drop it. Um, but if it's conical, like something chewed it to a point, then it's probably some kind of twig girdler. So you need to look at that end that's been cut. All right, thank you, Dennis. All right, your, your, next, your first one, Amy, is way cool. This is a York viewer. We've never seen this before on the show. Um, a green bean has some sort of hair-like structure growing out of it. What is this? This is really, really cool. I agree. And a big thank you to Lauren Giesler for identifying this for us. This is actually a slime mold. So, you know, we talk about slime molds on turf and other, other places. This is actually a slime mold. So it's pretty unique. Um, you can just wash it off, and it's no big deal on your green beans. All right. <laughs> it's really creepy. All right. Uh, your next one is a Stanton viewer. Um, portions of the lawn were showing signs of drought the last couple of weeks. She mowed. Then they got two inches of rain over the next two days. By Sunday, two days later, they had a, a ball field stripe pattern going on. Yeah, it's following all those mower wheel tracks. So what we're actually dealing with here is brown patch. And we're having brown patch show up everywhere throughout the state. It likes high nitrogen, dense turf. Um, but what happened here most likely is she mowed when the grass was still a little wet. And so the fungus is actually able to get on the tires and moved wherever she mowed. And then we got that nice rain that made it very favorable. At this point in time, I wouldn't treat anything for it for brown patch. Instead, we're going to be looking at overseeding with a more resistant variety this fall. Um, and then looking at your nitrogen management plan because once again, it favors high nitrogen. So we don't want to make we want to make sure we're not putting all that nitrogen down in the fall or in the spring. We want to put three quarters of that nitrogen down in the fall. Um, to help root growth and helps prevent brown patch. All right, and your final one is an Omaha viewer. Uh, they think their lawn has some sort of a fungus, fungus. among us too. It so is. It's that wonderful brown patch. It is just yeah. the time of year for it. It likes high humidity and heat. All and right. so with the rains that we've had, that's what we're running into. All right, thank you, Amy. All right, these sound like they belong to somebody else, John, but you are the vegetable man. Okay. So uh, your first one here is a collapsed zucchini. What happened here? So really, Kyle should be answering this one, I think. Uh, this, I think, is squash vine borer. If you look at that main vine at the bottom of the plant, mm -hmm. it looks all kind of mushy and gunky. So there's a, a, a moth, a clear wing moth that looks like a wasp. She comes along and she lays her eggs at the base and the little babies think, this is a tasty squash and they burrow right in there, uh, and then they cause all kinds of damage and it will eventually kill the plant. So you can keep a watch out and look at the base of your squash plants, and you can do surgery if you catch them early. You can do like a little scalpel or a little needle and go in there and you know uh, stick him and kill him or like pull him out, you know, like a little uh, worm extraction going on, very tasty. Uh, or uh, you can uh, do a little bit of like a, uh, an insecticide treatment around the base of it whenever it's time, uh, sort of like carbaryl, uh, something like that, or maybe pyrethrin. All right, excellent. And you got these questions because Kyle's bucket was full, but he's over here nodding his head. <laughs> right, yeah. So we also have, your next one, John, is parsnips. This is from Grand Island. Um, the, the leaves turn yellow, curl, and then they die. What's up? Well, I'm not exactly sure. Maybe Amy knows. This looks like a disease to me, but I don't think it's anything that's like really an issue that would cause like a long-term damage or kill the plant. I think it's just some sort of foliar disease, and I don't think it'll kill the whole plant at once. If it does start to take out the whole plant, you might want to look at some sort of broad-spectrum uh, fungicide 
like copper sulfate, but I don't know that, that it's really anything that needs to be treated. I would recommend that you flip the leaf over and look for any fuzzy growth on there. On parsnips, we can find downy mildew. So that's what I would look for, which usually only with really wet conditions. All right, and John, your final one comes to us from Illinois. And this is, uh, why is the broccoli plant rotting at the base? Because it's rotting at the base. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is probably a soft rot, which yeah. affects a lot of those broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower. Uh, actually, it probably came in on the plant. Uh, once it gets to that point, there's really nothing that you can do. Just take it out before it can spread, and it will overwinter in the area. Uh, so just take that out uh, and make sure you're buying high-quality plants uh, and just keep a lookout for that. All right, thank you, John. Well, you know, milkweed is one of those fabulous plants, both for pollinators and all sorts of beneficial insects. So here's Scott Evans to tell us a lot about different kinds of milkweed and what they provide for us. We've talked about milkweed before here at Backyard Farmer. We know it's an important pollinating plant to incorporate into your landscape because many of our bees, butterflies, and wasps will visit that plant. It's also the larvae host for the monarch butterfly. So let's talk about some of these milkweeds. The first one is the common milkweed. This is the plant we most think of. It's a taller plant growing between three and five foot tall. It has those large oval shaped leaves. It does well in dry locations but it can meander through underground stems, so keep that in mind. The next milkweed is the butterfly milkweed. This plant is becoming more popular in the garden center, but be a little bit leery because some of those new cultivars are not as hardy as we would like them to be. The plant grows between two, maybe up to three foot tall. It is a clump forming plant, so it's not going to spread through underground stems, but it can self-seed, so you're going to get volunteers popping up throughout your garden. The next clump forming milkweed is the swamp milkweed. This is a tall plant. It can easily get up to five foot tall, maybe up to six foot or taller. As the name implies, swamp milkweeds like what locations? It is a clump forming milkweed, so it's not going to spread through underground stems, but it can self-seed, so you'll get volunteers popping up as well. The next milkweed is the world milkweed. This is a shorter plant. This plant only grows between 18 and 24 inches tall, but what makes it interesting is that it has needle-like foliage and white flowers. And like the common milkweed, it too can spread through underground stems, so keep that in mind. Back in 2019, the University of Kentucky did a study on the placement of milkweed within the landscape. And what they found is that the plants that were planted along the perimeter or the edge of the flower garden were visited more often by the monarch butterfly and they had more eggs laying on them. So this fall, when you're thinking about revitalizing your garden or if you're looking at changing up your plant um, palette, think about adding some milkweed into your garden and plant them along the edge of the garden to help the butterflies. And if only to help those monarchs, that's a great idea, but some of them smell wonderful and some of them really run. All right, so your final round of pictures. Let's see, Kyle, your first one, this is from a Paxton viewer. She has slugs on her cherries. What are these? Yeah, these, these are actually not slugs. It's a commonly called pear slug sawfly. Um, cherry is one of the preferred hosts. Um, there's two, two generations generally in the year, first in July, second, around September. Um, probably the best thing to do for these is you know, give them a really good spray with the hose, um, a, a nice, stream of water should knock most of them off to the ground um, and they can't get back up. All right, excellent. Your next one is a four inch long insect and this comes to us from Beaver Crossing. What is this? This is a female Dobson fly. They're, um, the larvae are aquatic in, in fast moving streams and feed on other insects and then um, the adults are, are highly attracted to light and so we commonly see them showing up around there. All right, and finally, and we've already talked about the hole this makes, but this viewer wants to know what this large insect is. Yep, this is another cicada killer wasp. 
um, you know, really not not anything to worry about. They're they're big and intimidating, but um, but they're they're not a threat around. All right, excellent. Thank you, Kyle. All right, Dennis. Uh, this comes to us from Scotts Bluff. This is every year something attacks her roses. Uh, she's never been able to see any insects, and she wants. And and this happens just as they're beginning to flower. Any ideas on this? Well. Yeah, that first of all, young rabbits like to go for the complete foliage. Little grooves out of it, that's probably an insect of some type, maybe a flying insect. I don't know if it's some kind of leaf cutter, but when you see those round <coughs> holes, it, you would, it, would, it would be an insect because there's no vertebrapest that has a round mouth to do that. Um, but so I would, even though you don't see the insect, if it flies in and out, I would go that way. If you want to eliminate it being a rabbit or a verb pest, just put some talc powder down. And if you get no footprints in that talc powder, then it's a flying in insect. All right, excellent idea. All right, then you have a, uh, one picture from a Lincoln viewer. A plumber told them that they have bats in their belfry here. Well, I think the plumber has something in its belfry because there's no smudge marks from bats and that crack is too small for even our smallest bat. Um, it may be an insect going in and out there or something else occurring. But when bats go in and out of a small crack, they have a, a lot of oil in their skin and they leave what we call smudge marks. And this attracts other bats and this is clean with no smudge marks. So I would say not bats. All right, thank you, Dennis. All right, uh, Amy, speaking of maples in Cozad, Nebraska, uh, this uh, only tree in the front yard has something wrong, started last year. And I think we have two or three pictures on this one that show uh, what's going on with this particular maple. So once again, it is showing those classic symptoms of iron chlorosis bright yellow leaves with dark veins. And so it's one of those situations, it's soil type, it is the type of soil that we have. There isn't a lot we can do. The tree will be fine. It'll just be a little yellow in coloration. All right. And your final one uh, comes to us from North Platte. He was cutting down some dead limbs on an ash about 20 years old. He noticed this sort of cut line on the branches, but then this strange patterning on the foliage. What it, any ideas on this one? So I will be honest, this one really stumped me trying to figure out what was going on. Um, the, the leaf pattern okay. kind of maybe leans so or maybe questions. some anthracnose going on there. Um, but the lines on the branches don't line up to be any uh, disease issue. I didn't know if it would be insect related going over to Kyle most likely. Yeah, that's that's interesting. It didn't immediately look like any any borers or any you know girdlers or anything that I'm aware of. Usually they would use you know smaller twigs than than what that looked like. Um, I didn't immediately recognize it either. So maybe send us in a sample so we could take a closer look. And if all else fails, we'll throw it to Dennis and maybe he'll say it's some vertebrate. No, no. Oh, man, <laughs> I could always hope. <laughs> or perhaps not. Yeah, all right. John, uh, this comes to us from St. Paul, Nebraska, not over there. Not up Minnesota. North. Yep. Okay. This is a black beauty eggplant. She had uh, three plants from the same seed packet. Only one of the three developed these dreadful spikes on the midrib of the leaf. What is up with that? So isn't that interesting? So eggplant, uh, if you notice, on the fruit and, and developing, there's like little hairy spiky things there. And most of the old varieties and types of eggplant used to have these spikes all over their leaves, but the newer cultivars, as we, as we bred them out, they've sort of bred that out of the plant because it's not pleasant to have big spiky plants in your garden, right? So that's really just, that's reverted back to that. That's sort of come out on that one plant. Very interesting, just you know, steer clear. <laughs> All right. Uh, your next one here comes to us from somebody whose neighbor has a calla lily. Uh, they know that they are not supposed to overwinter in our zone, but this one has come back year after year, bigger and better. Uh, he is actually going to share it if we think this can be split and moved into a different location. Any advice? Well, that is very interesting because usually calla lily is only hardy to zone eight. Um, but I think we have the perfect storm here. You see a sidewalk 
and I think there's a wall immediate, immediately behind it. And I think that's creating a microclimate that in the winter, the sun hits the wall and the sidewalk warms them up, keeps them warm. And at night when it's coldest, it releases that heat. And so I think it's protecting that plant. So unless you can recreate those, it may not live if you're going to move a piece somewhere else. All right. And your final one actually is a Lincoln viewer. And uh, they, they found this wild strawberry plant. And they're wondering whether it can be fertilized or fed somehow to produce actual edible big strawberries. So that's sort of a sneaky little plant. That's not really a wild strawberry. That's a false strawberry. Uh, you can tell it has yellow flowers. And if you look at that little fruit, the, the, what we think of as seeds, which are the actual fruit of the plant, are on the outside of the red part. Uh, if it were a true wild strawberry, the flowers would be white. Uh, and the, the fruit, the, the strawberry would have those seeds or really the, the fruits on the inside like a regular strawberry. So don't waste your time because number one, it'll never get bigger. And number two, they really don't taste like anything. <laughs> right, so it, it's, it, it'll taste like water. So just don't. Just take it out. It's a weed. <laughs> All right. Thank you, John. All right, Kyle, we have time for a question or two for each of you. This one comes to us from Clarkson. She has a terrible time with grasshoppers. And she's used seven and a couple of other things, and she's treating them when they're quarter inch to half an inch, not working. What are you going to suggest for treating grasshoppers in the garden? Um, yeah, so it's, uh, carbaryl is, is good, sev seven, um, and absolutely doing the right thing, getting them when they're small, that's when they're most susceptible. Um, don't do well as they get bigger. <laughs> You know, what I suspect is probably happening, um, this is the big issue with grasshoppers, is, um, you know, they're in dry years, they tend to, they tend to really boom. And then um, as sort of other vegetation around, so if you have, you know, if you live out of town, if there's grass, you know, around that's drying down, anything like that, they're probably moving in from, from that other plant material that's drying down looking for, for green, fresh food. And so it might just be something that you're, you're going to continually battle because otherwise you really should be effective uh, carbaryl on, on young grasshoppers. All right. Den Dennis, we have about a minute for a okay. question and we had one from our audience here in COZAD that had something to do with your absolute favorite creature, snakes. Okay. So <laughs> they, uh, they want to know how to control snakes. Why? <laughs> they don't carry any germs or viruses and they just help. I don't understand. But if it's garter snakes around the house, no chemical repellent works. We tested them uh, to our blue in the face. We tested about everything on the market. Uh, but we did find repellency with lava rock landscaping. And I know horticulturists hate lava rock landscaping. But if you put it next to your house, six inches deep by two foot wide, garter snakes cannot get into it, or any snake cannot get into it, and they don't like to crawl on it. 